Well, good morning, Torrance First Baptist. I want to say hello to you who are here. I want to say hello to those of you who are online, who are having my voice in the background as you're preparing for your party later today. Just kidding. If y'all are online, we still love you, and uh, Jesus loves you too. Is there something kind of crazy going on today? Is anything? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, who's excited for the Cincinnati? Oh, wrong city. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> well, whatever your allegiance is to, may we be united in our allegiance to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, before we begin in this worship, I want to lead us through a psalm, Psalm 8. And it goes like this. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Will you rise with us as we continue our worship to him?
guys sound wonderful, by the way. This song is King of Kings, and it just goes through declaring that he is the one true living God. So let's sing this together. <clears throat> someone next to you and tell them we are here to praise the King of Kings.
Good morning, family. Oh, how wonderful it is to see you today. We're so thankful you're here to worship the Lord as we fellowship together in Jesus' name. I have some important announcements for us. First of all, men's breakfast and women's bunco night next Saturday, or uh, next Saturday, March 12th. <laughs> Just a little ahead of myself. Let's start again. Men's breakfast, women's bunco night, March 12th. There's a sign up outside in the patio. We trust you'll avail yourselves of that. And then on March the 13th, the next day, that Sunday, we'll have a baptismal service. And if you would like to know more about baptism or you know about it and you want to uh, be baptized, see Pastor Jared, Jeremy, or myself and, we, and Carla, we would be more than happy to share with you what it means to be baptized and to take this step of, of discipleship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is Richard and Becky Darrow's last Sunday. Dear family, are you here today? I looked out earlier and I did not see them. Uh, the Darrow's have been with us for a number of years and they're moving, so we will pray for them after we end our announcements. But just know that you might uh, find out from the office where they're moving. We can drop them a line and let them know how thankful we are for them. But right now, I want Jeremy to come up. Jeremy, come and talk to us. Well, hello, I'm back. And um, last Sunday, uh, did you notice that it was a little bit more quiet at church? Maybe a little bit more peaceful and serene? That was because 15 of our junior high students <laughs> were gone. Uh, we went up to uh, the San Bernardino Mountains, and we had an awesome time going to Camp Pondo. Um, so yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about how it was, or I'll, actually I'll have the students tell you a little bit about how that was in a second. But the main thing I want to do here is just give thanks to, first of all, to God uh, for allowing that, for allowing all this to be possible. I want to thank Mr. Dave Fleming for driving for us because he picked up the van, a 15 passenger van for us from LAX, came back here, drove us there, drove back, then drove back again, came back, and then returned the van the next day. So Mr. Dave, wherever you're at, wherever the shiny is, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I also want to lift up the leaders too. So uh, Miss Amy Kilduff, Miss Don Brignano, um, there was Matthew Simpson, my fiance Grace Gilman was there, and then yours truly. So we had a, such an awesome time being able to serve the junior hires over the course of the weekend. Um, I was really shaped by this one verse. It was 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and it says that Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And I think as a junior, as a, like a youth minister, it, feel like, oh man, I kind of have to make all this stuff happen. I need to have all these kids make all these awesome decisions. But I noticed God's like, hey, it's not in your hands. It's up to me. <laughs> so you're not called to make the increase happen. All you're called to do is to cultivate a, an environment that is conducive towards growth, and I'll provide the growth. So that shaped everything, and I was, I was such in a good heart space to be able to um, serve the kids. It was so amazing. So um, we have one more picture, Ms. Ann. I guess you can sh show them that, too. So uh, that's us. Yeah, we're in the snow. It's, it, looks like, it looks like snow, but it was actually just one big chunk of ice. And if you fell, you got a concussion. So it, it was really hard. But um, anyways, uh, junior hires, if you, had the chance to come up, if you had the chance to go to that camp, or if you're just a junior hire, come up and come here, please. Come on, come on, come on. Good morning, guys. I feel like y'all don't wake up this early usually, so. <laughs> so, I have the junior high kids with me. Um, they would like to share with you, some of them at least, would like to share with you what their favorite experience of camp was and also what was a lesson that they learned from Pastor Josh. So without further ado, who would like to share? Hello. Um, one of the things that Pastor Josh shared with us was that even through ups and downs, God will always still be there with you and will be there to help you through it and 
be at your side. Um, one of my favorite memories of camp was mystery karaoke. Um, Matthew had to go up and sing Let It Go. And um, one thing that Pastor Josh taught me was that you're never forgotten, even when you feel like you are. Um, I really liked the pastor there, Pastor Josh. He was really connecting with the other junior high kids. And the thing that I learned was that there are so many interruptions in this world, but nothing can interrupt God. I just wanted to thank Jeremy for being there with us and leading us down the right path of God's path. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Two seconds. Okay. These are my junior hires kit, um, and they were amazing. You know, junior hires are junior hires, so y'all know what that means. But um, bes besides that, we just had such a great time. And I just remember uh, the small group times that we had together with the boys and the girls. And I just heard that there were great sessions with the girls talking about God not forgetting who you are. And then for us as guys, we were talking about, man, let's be vulnerable because uh, I feel like society doesn't let us do that. So let's, uh, yeah, let's be able to share what's going on in our lives. So, junior hires, thank you so much. Y'all may head back to your seats now. Um, yeah. Pastor Raj has one last announcement. Having taught junior high in the past, I know what a blast it is. And uh, it is a blast, is it not? Uh, we want to we wanna pray not only for what the Lord has done for our junior hires, but we also want to pray for our high schoolers who go next weekend. So as you put on your calendar for the week, remember uh, Friday they leave and we want to pray for our high schoolers that God will just bless them abundantly. So let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for all you have done for us. We thank you for what you did in the lives of our junior high young people. What a blessing that is and so good to hear from them. We love them. We're thankful for them and we ask your blessing upon them. We ask your blessing upon Jeremy as he leads them. And now we pray for our high schoolers. We just pray that, that you would be with them, for Ann and all of those who, who work with them. We pray that this next week will be a week of growth, will be a week when they really, uh, in a fresh way, discover your love for them. So bless them, Father. Bless our young people and our young adults. We just pray that uh, we'll see growth and, and uh, that they will know how much they're appreciated here. This we ask in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. 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 Well, let's sing together, and then the choir is actually going to sing afterwards. But we're going to start with a song by John W. Peterson. Many of you will know it. If, if you're not, and you want to look, at the, it's in the hymnals in front of you. It's 494, but the, the lyrics will be overhead. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. Let's stand as we sing. omnipotent and that you can't deny a god of might and miracles tis written in the sky it took a miracle to put the stars in place it took a miracle to hang the world in space but when he Eternity. It 
Now we're going to sing a psalm right from Psalm 97. You are exalted above all gods. It's number 31. I exalt thee.
Let's sing in response. Alleluia. 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 praise this morning, and hallelujah means praise the Lord. We, we are, there's no one else that we can praise and honor and glorify. You alone are worthy. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for creating us a little lower than the angels for how much you love us and care for us, and thank you, God, that we can be here this morning to worship and glorify you, and we pray that uh, you would bless the rest of this morning to your glory. In Jesus' name. All righty. Good morning, church. How are we all doing this morning? I'm glad you're here and not somewhere else because there's nothing really big going on today, right? There's not a reason that I wore certain colors this morning, is there? I might be showing my, my colors here today, but uh, anyways, um, I want to I just say a little bit. Um, some of the staff, we had an opportunity to go to the Transformation Ministries Conference on Thursday and Friday where we were, man, inspired and challenged and, and equipped just to, to really uh, live for, for Jesus and realize that only God can. Uh, that was our theme for the, the weekend. And I want to encourage you, um, and this is not just for pastors. Lay people can go and stuff like that. So would, uh, next year when we, when we uh, go, we'll extend the invite to anybody to go because this is a great conference, a great, great way to really just focus in, meet other people from other churches in our region and, and just do some networking and, and really uh, just grow in our relationship with the Lord. And once again, only God can. Uh, how many of you guys believe that? Only God, right? No, no one else can. Um, now, uh, another note, how many of you like contradictions? Nobody really likes those, right? Uh, we we kind of get annoyed by them, but life seems to be full of contradictions, right? It's things that don't really make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I won't even get into, okay, never mind. Um, but anyways, life seems to be full of contradictions. Uh, like the postmaster who emailed his employees that electric correspondence was ruining their business. <laughs> if you're not laughing, you didn't get it. I'm so sorry. Um, but anyways, um, or the sign in a window of a coffee shop that read free coffee, $1. <laughs> or my favorite, another sign that reads, honk if you love peace and quiet. Wow. Um, but anyways, th those are all uh, obviously tongue-in-cheek and, and meant to be funny and silly. But sadly, there are many people who look at the Word of God and see contradictions, right? They're, they're, they're quick to point out things that don't make sense, that might seem to contradict itself. For example, they point to the differences between the four Gospels saying, oh my goodness, there's so many contradictions there and how could you follow that it's just a you know not even they're not even saying the same story how can they believe how can i believe what they say but the problem is they're not taking the time to understand that these gospels were written for different purposes different audiences and present a different picture not not a different picture but the same picture with nuances geared for specific audiences right um and and actually paint for me a more fuller picture of christ 
I love the fact that there are four different accounts of the Gospels because it just makes that picture of Jesus even more bigger. More bigger. Did you like my English today? Yeah. By the way, did you notice the title for the sermon today? Even more better than angels. Now that's a contradiction, right? Even more, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but anyways, um, we're going to see today how the author of Hebrews addresses what must have been or what must have seemed like a contradiction to the people, especially the naysayers of that day. Um, last week, if you remember, we uh, took a break from this argument of the supremacy of Jesus over the angels, and, and the author gave his first warning passage, basically, don't neglect Jesus. And now this week, we're going to get back to the argument, though, that Jesus is better than angels. And you're going to notice a subtle shift in the theme, before it was the Son of God is better than angels. Today, it's how the Son of Man is better than angels. And we definitely need his help today, so let's bow in prayer, okay? Uh, Father, thank you so much that you are good. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you give us your word, which we know is not full of contradictions, but we know points to the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Help us today to see clearly that he is better than angels. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, perhaps you thought two weeks ago that we were done talking about angels. Uh, well, you thought too soon because the author of Hebrews felt that another facet of the comparison between Jesus and the angels was necessary to discuss. Now, one commentator said, Jesus is shown to be further superior to the angels since as son of man, the world is subjected to him. Now, when we refer to Jesus as the son of man, what are we doing? We are uh, referring to a lot of things. There's a lot there. Um, where did our, we don't have our slides? Okay, she disappeared. All right, uh, and there she comes. <laughs> um, the, the son of man, and so if you're following along, we're going to put that up on the, on the outline here. Wrong, wrong sermon. Okay, that, you know, we'll give Anne a pass. Why? Because she was at the conference with me, and trust me, we were there like all day Thursday and, and Friday, so praise God. If you're following, you look in your bulletins, it's in there. So anyway, so the Son of Man, um, there's a lot there, but we know that it's the title that he used most often for himself, referring to both his humanity and his position as the Messiah. Now, later in the spring, we're going to take a short break from Hebrews, and we're really going to dig into who Jesus is, get, get, get some, some doctrinal uh, thoughts and ideas on Christology, on who Jesus is, dealing with some of these titles that, that he gave himself or that was given to him. For now, though, let's see what Hebrews has to say about the Son of Man being greater than the angels. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll begin with verse 5 through 9. So turn with me there. Verse 5 through 9 says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. Yet you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for every one. And we'll go ahead and, and stop right there. And we need to ask the question of why the author even needs to go here. Why does he need to even bring this up? He's already established that the Son of God is superior to the angels. What is this section all about? Well, implied here, you'll see it's the question of his humanity. And you can bet that many, and trust me, many were asking at that time, well, doesn't the fact that Jesus became a man, that he took on flesh, that he became human, contradict the fact that he is superior uh, than these angels. Like these angels, angels have access to God, to heaven. Man, man doesn't. Angels are immortal. Man is not. Angels were instrumental in giving the law. Man is subject to the law. Angels have some sort of rule over this present age, and, and man does not. What's the deal with, with that? Well, verse 5, as it says, sets the stage 
although itself is not really a complete thought, but it sets that stage. Basically, the world which is to come, the future salvation or consummation of salvation, which has been inaugurated by Jesus, is not to be ruled by the angels. Rather, as Calvin said, it's to be ruled, the world to come is not that which we hope for after the resurrection, but that which began at the beginning of Christ's kingdom, but no doubt will have its full accomplishment in our final redemption. It's that already but not yet nature of the kingdom of God. And so the world now is subject to the Son of God. The quotation here in this passage, as we see in verse 6, is from Psalm 8, 4 through 6, which the choir sang and Jeremy began our service with today. It's a direct quote of that psalm. So when the author says, don't you love this? It has been testified somewhere. Uh, where? It's not like the author forgot where it was testified, okay? He's, he's, it's not saying that. But what he's saying is, like, you know, like I often do, I often forget where I'm going. But it's the psalm that was read to begin, like I said, our service today. And notice here it says, for a little while, and the phrase, that's a phrase which is from the LXX, uh, which, by the way, what's the LXX again? Septuagint, yeah, you guys are good, you've been listening. On the surface, it does look like it's totally only for humanity in general. And that may very well be, as many scholars make that application. And this may have been an attempt by the author to kind of encourage the church. Remember, the church was undergoing persecution, suffering. They needed to be encouraged that, look, hey, just for a little while, and then one day you're going to rule with me forever. But this use of the term son of man here is picked up by the author, links it also to Jesus. The author is fully aware that Jesus used this title of himself and thus applies it to him. According to Thomas Hewitt, it says, Man, though for a short time made lower than angels, was and is destined to occupy the highest place among God's creatures, and even angels are to come under his dominion. But this will be realized only in and through the man, Jesus Christ. And Hughes says, We must understand that Psalm 8 was not only a celebration of the significance of man in the vast cosmos, but it was a messianic psalm that had an ultimate fulfillment in Christ. You see, friends, Hebrews is about fulfillment, and Christ fulfills all. Amen? Christ fulfills all. Jesus is the ultimate man, the fulfillment of what God intended man to be. So ultimately, boy, that's a lot of ultimates. (laughs) It's about him. It's about Jesus. And this section should remind us then of the Christ hymn in Philippians 2, 6 through 11, which says, who though Jesus was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him And bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You see, now that's a hymn, if there ever was one. That's a hymn. So we see now that his humanity does not contradict the fact that he is better than angels. In that emptying of himself, in that taking on of human flesh, for a time his glory was obscured, only to return then to his exalted state, crowned with glory and honor, as the psalm says, and as Philippians said, with everything in subjection to him, including the angels. Nothing, nothing is outside of his control. Nothing is outside of his control control, it says. Now, wait a minute. Why does it seem like that's not the case? Why does it seem like I look around the world and, and I see chaos and I see immorality running, running rampant where uh, football games get more glory than the Savior? Well, yeah, I said that. <laughs> Um, where there are, there are powers and forces, both spiritual and, and human, that, that do not acknowledge his sovereignty, that do not bow down in allegiance to the king of kings. Chaos, immorality, outright 
outright denial of his existence, let alone his rule. Now, what's the deal with that? As I mentioned before, we live in this already but not yet kingdom of God. The kingdom broke into our existence because Jesus became a man. And yet we're still waiting for that final consummation. But does that mean that we don't live as kingdom citizens, kingdom saints now? No. We live that now. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We are saints. We are a a body of priests called to declare his glory and to realize that nothing's outside of his control. If in anticipation of that, the author says that although at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, nevertheless, what does it say? It says we see him. We see Jesus. That's what we see. Note that first use of his human name here. First time the author of Hebrews mentions that. And I think that's really to draw attention to the fact that he was human, that Jesus was his human name. But also, what does that name mean? Yahweh, or God, is salvation. It would remind them of the fact that Jesus, in his humanity, came, died, suffered, and yet rose again gloriously and victoriously, crowned with glory and honor, like that prophecy of Daniel in Daniel 7, 13 through 14, which says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Who's on the throne? Jesus. Jesus is on the throne. So despite what sort of discouragement, what sort of chaos, what sort of apathy, what sort of anything else that would say, that would make us think that he's not on the throne, the reality is he is on the throne and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Because as Hewitt says, the eye of faith perceives that Jesus is already crowned with glory and honor. As we alluded to in verse 5, it's that already not yet nature of the kingdom of God. His rule has been inaugurated. His kingdom is at hand. And although it hasn't reached its consummation, it has broken through. And in fact, he tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. Okay? And then that links his crowning then with his death. Why was he made lower than the angels? Why was he made to be a human? So that he could die so that he could die, to redeem us. That was the purpose of the incarnation. He was born to die. Jesus tasted death. And by the way, tasted doesn't mean he just licked death. (laughs) He tasted it in its fullness. He tasted death so that we don't have to. That is what the grace of God is. In the imagery of the king's table, if you know ancient times, The cupbearer was the one to taste that wine, right? So that the king didn't have to just in case it was poisoned. But in that same imagery, the cupbearer, where he tastes that wine to make sure it does not carry the death of poison, the king himself became the cupbearer and tasted death. The wine of death for you and I. Oh, what a savior. Oh, what a savior. And then that serves now as a great transition to what follows. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 2. It says, For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified All have one source, and that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, like he himself likewise took 
partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And so our second point today is like the first, where his... Superiority to angels was not contradicted by the fact that he became human. It is also not contradicted by the fact that he had to suffer, that he had to suffer and die. And again, you can see where the naysayers are coming in. Why would God suffer? He's God. Call the angels down. Get them off the cross. Why go through this humiliation? Can't he just snap his fingers and then everything's good? It's not how he chose to do it. And his... his Supremacy isn't contradicted by that. Why? Because A, it identified us with him. It identified him with humanity. He was able to identify with each of us. We know that this argument then builds on the previous one by the use of that word for. In verse 10, now we have to unpack this a bit. First, the players. The one for whom and by whom all things exist, that's the Father. The founder of our salvation, that's Jesus. Many sons, daughters, followers of Jesus. Okay, good. And so it was fitting. It was fitting for the Father then to bring us to glory, to perfect Jesus through his suffering. Okay, wait a minute. Perfect Jesus? A couple questions come to mind, do they not here? First is, why was suffering the fitting way to bring sons to glory? I don't know about you. Suffering doesn't seem any fitting way to me, all <laughs> right? I want to avoid it at all costs, right? I, I, I do my best to not suffer, okay? Uh, I drink coffee in the morning so that I can wake up and not suffer throughout the day, right? I, I avoid certain times on the freeway when I know it's going to be traffic unless I absolutely have to, and then only begrudgingly. I don't want to suffer, right? Push that stuff away. But it says it was fitting, to bring sons to glory through his suffering. And here's why. I love what Dennis Johnson says here. It says, ancient pagans and Jews found Jesus' suffering on the cross both foolish and offensive, right? Foolish and offensive, not at all a fitting way for the creator and sustainer of all things to remedy the plight of humanity. And of course, Paul addressed this in 1 Corinthians 1.23. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles, a seeming contradiction, if you will. But why was it fitting? To bring us to glory. To bring us to glory, that stain and that penalty of sin had to be dealt with. You see, friends, that is the message of the gospel, that you and I are marred by sin, and we need a Savior. We need it. God himself to step down, to take on human flesh and to suffer and die so that we can be in right relationship with him if we place belief and trust in him. F.F. Bruce says this, it is in the passion of our Lord that we see the very heart of God laid bare. Nowhere Is God more fully or more worthily revealed as God than when we see him in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? Thus, the suffering of the suffering servant was fitting. I love how Stuart Townend, modern hymn writer, uh, put it in in one of my favorite songs, which we're actually going to close the service with today. He said this, How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain 
of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Food for thought. If it was fitting for the son to suffer, what does that say about the place of suffering for you and I? It's not something we have a lot of time to get into today, but a good springboard as you converse with your friends and your family throughout this week. What is the place of suffering? If Jesus himself had to suffer, what does that mean about our suffering? The second question that comes up is this. In what sense did Jesus need to be made perfect? And it says he was made perfect through his suffering. What does that mean? I thought he was already perfect, is he not? He's Jesus, right? He's the son of God. He's perfect. How do you make something more perfecter? In saying that Jesus was made perfect, the author is not suggesting that Jesus was in any way less than perfect. He was not sinful. But that as he lived his human life, he grew, he matured, always in obedience to the Father. Thus, he became both the perfect priest and the perfect sacrifice. As F.F. F. Bruce said, the perfect Son of God has become the people's perfect Savior. And in verse 11, we have another four. The sanctifier, the one who makes holy, is Jesus. Those being sanctified, i.e. being made holy, are his followers, who, notice, he's not ashamed to call brother or sister due to their common source. What is that source, you ask? Uh, some say it's their common humanity. Some say it's their common ancestry, their father. In other words, the source, though, is both. Since Christ and believers share both a common spiritual life and common humanity, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Isn't it great that he's not ashamed of us? Because, boy, I feel so ashamed of myself sometimes. How many times have I blown it? How many times have I fallen short of the glory of God? But he's not ashamed of me. Even in my sinfulness, even while I was yet a sinner, what does it say? Christ He's not ashamed. In verse 12 and 13, he gives three texts to support what he's saying. The first one, appropriately, is from Psalm 22, verse 22. Do you know the 22nd Psalm? Where else have we heard the 22nd Psalm? From the lips of Jesus as he hung on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is associated with his death, but it is also associated with his resurrection. Jesus has this psalm in mind when he cries out from the cross. And here at this psalm's turning point in verse 22 is the turning point from suffering to glory. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, it says. That resurrected Messiah is shown declaring the name of God to them as well as worshiping God in their midst. Confused? So am I. No, I'm just kidding. Basically, he's identifying with them. He's worshiping with them. What comfort in the midst of persecution to know that the resurrected Lord has adopted us into his family. As R. Kent Hughes says, by recalling the amazing words of Psalm 22, the writer means for the healing salve of Christ's solidarity to further mend the struggling church's fear-infected wounds. How many of us are living in fear today? How many of us are afraid that the next variant is going to come out and, oh boy, here we go, shut down again? How many of us live in fear of what's going on in the realms of politics, media, culture? I 
We are told that perfect love casts out fear. We are told that he has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. And this would mend their fear-infected wounds, it said. The second and third quotes are from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. Again, from the Septuagint. If you thought that the connection of that previous passage was hard to see, this one's even harder. Um, Again, we don't have a ton of time to go there, but in Isaiah chapter 8, we're told that the prophet Isaiah puts his trust in God. So many people around him were denying God. They were being persecuted. They were denying God, serving other gods, turning their backs on him, going to idols, whatever it may be. But the prophet Isaiah, almost by himself, alone, trusting God, trusting in his plan while many around him do not. And he links himself with the children. Uh, his own children, by the way, have, have these kind of crazy names, which reveal the fact that God is going to raise up a remnant. That even though it seems like around us, how many of you feel that way? Like, there's no one around me that believes in Jesus. I'm on an island by myself. Students, as you go to school, you feel that way? Nobody else here believes in Jesus. But Isaiah, in the midst of that same sort of a, of a culture, trusts in God. And this believing remnant will trust in God. If you remember, two weeks ago, I introduced the topic of typology in which Old Testament figures or concepts serve to point to or typify Christ receiving their fulfillment in him. And in this passage, Isaiah then serves as a type of Christ, just like Isaiah trusted God and associated himself with the people. Jesus trusts God and identifies himself with you and I, trusting children of the Father. So once again, he identifies with us. Now, secondly, the other reason why it didn't contradict his his suffering, doesn't contradict his supremacy over angels, is the fact that his suffering destroyed Satan and delivered us from sin. Amen? Amen. Notice again the reminder of this identification with humanity. The first half of verse 16 then leads to the second reason. His suffering does not contradict his superiority to angels. First, we see in verse 14 is that he might destroy the one who has the power of death, the devil. Apropos that he should mention this here in the context of Jesus being better than angels, because what do we know about Satan himself? He was an angel. He's a fallen angel. Look at all this power seemingly that this Satan guy has. Right? He's one of your angels. But he's a fallen angel. And we know that 1 John 3, 8 says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared, though, John says, was to destroy the works of the devil. And yet, how many times do you and I or other people around us offer the excuse, the devil made me do it? Friends, the devil doesn't make us do anything. He has no power to do so. His power is to tempt. But we have a power that is greater. For greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Satan's main work is to bring death. Whatever power he has, he has some. (laughs) It's in that realm of death or the ability to tempt people to sin, which we know leads to death. I do want to mention that his power is not, nor has it ever been absolute. Even before Christ, what kind of power does Satan have? Only that which God allows him to have. Take the story of Job, right? It's a great example. God's in the throne room. Angels are coming back and forth. Messengers telling him what's going on. And here comes Satan, the accuser. Right? And he says, well, you know, what about, what about Job? See, he has to ask God for permission 
to even touch him. So even before Christ, he's only allowed to do what he does because God allows it. The only way that Satan is able to rake someone over the coals is, wait, he can't. He can't. I digress. Furthermore, in this passage, we see that Jesus, through his death, defeated Satan. He destroyed him. That word destroy means to bring to naught, to render inoperative, to make ineffective, to nullify, neutralize, to deprive of all power. Enough said. Enough said. Verse 15 then gives us the second half of this point, that Jesus' death accomplished not only the defeat of Satan, but deliverance from sin. His sacrifice paid our debt, released us from the fear of death, which was huge for the persecuted Hebrew church. As Hugh said, this fearful specter was stalking this tiny storm-tossed first century church as it plied the seas of persecution. No one had yet been martyred for his or her faith, but the fear of death had its icy fingers around many trembling hearts, around those people who through their fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery, as it says. And yet we know that 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 56 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now just to make sure there's no confusion, He removed the sting of death, not death itself, for it is appointed once for all men to die. Unless Jesus comes again. (laughs) But the sting of death is gone. The fear of death is gone. The confusion surrounding death is gone. Because we know where we're going. Amen? delivered them from slavery to sin in order to help free or help mankind, as it says in verse 16, the offspring of Abraham, he became a human. Now, by referring to humans as offspring of Abraham, he's not limiting it to just the Jews because the promise made to Abraham was for the whole world. Galatians 3, 7 through 9, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. And so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. In verse 29, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and you are heirs according to promise. That's some good news, friends. That's some good news. Good news, which brings us to that final reason that his suffering doesn't contradict his superiority to angels, that it qualifies him to be our high priest. Much will be said about Jesus, the high priest, throughout the rest of Hebrews, so we won't spend too much time here. Just note that once again, through that, he is identified with humanity. He is made like us in every respect, albeit without sin. And that identification qualified him to be the high priest. In Jewish tradition, as you know, the high priest had to come from the line of Aaron. He had to be a Levite. He had to be one of the tribes of Israel. Dennis Johnson said, priestly intercession demands identification with those on whose behalf the priest intervenes with God. For their shared nature qualifies the priest to act as their representative, while their shared experience of suffering enriches his sympathy for them in their trials. As high priest, his job was to present the offering to God on behalf of the people on the Day of Atonement. He would literally wear stones with the tribes of Israel written on his shoulders and on his breast so that he could bear their burdens before God and bear their sin before him. That's what Jesus did. That offering would only, though, at that time, cover over the sins of the people, place them in right standing before God, but it was temporary. And now we know that Jesus fulfills this type. He is able to represent us in his humanity by offering himself as a propitiation 
for our sins. Now, propitiation is one of those theological words that we hear often. We might not know what it means. Basically, it means that he took our place. He took our place. Because of sin, we deserve death, and he then bore the penalty of that death sentence. And he removed the sin completely, not just covering it up, which is all those former high priests could do. And by the way, no need for a rope tied around his waist and bells on his robe, because Jesus is perfect. He's the faithful, trustworthy high priest. And additionally, due to his suffering when he was tempted then he's able to help us in our temptation. How many of you feel burdened by temptation? Come on, let's be honest. Oh my goodness. Jesus is able to help us in our temptation. Now, some may say, oh, there's another contradiction. How could he, how could he be tempted if he's not, he has no sin? How could he be tempted? Another contradiction. Well, Hughes says this, being the sinless son of God, Temptations repulsed him far more than they could us. I love that. Just because he didn't sin doesn't mean that temptation wasn't hard. In fact, when he was in the Garden of Eden, what happened? Blood, sweat. He was tempted before the enemy 40 days, starving, (laughs) hungry. And what does Satan do? Turn these stones to bread. Now, if that isn't temptation, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. His temptation by the enemy in the desert was real. Satan tried every trick in the book, preying on what could have been his points of weakness in order to get him to forsake God's will. By the way, his family tempted him. They wanted him to denounce God. His disciples tempted him. Oh, no, Jesus, you never get behind me, Satan. And again, in that garden, in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, we're told that he was anguished to the point of death. God, if it's if, if, if at all possible, take this, take this from me, he said. But he overcame. He said, what? Not my will, but yours be done. But yours be done. He dealt with the lack of faith of his disciples, rejection by his own people. And yet he continued to the end. Now, this would be of great encouragement to the Hebrew church, suffering persecution, tempted to go back to Judaism. What a source of strength was to them to be assured that in the presence of God, They had both their champion and intercessor, one who had temptations just like they did, and even worse, and stood up and was victorious. So friends, as we've seen today, the humanity and suffering of the Son of Man did in no way contradict the fact that he is even more better (laughs) than angels. In fact, it only serves to enhance it because it makes what he did for us a fitting sacrifice. It identified him with those he came to save. He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters and to bring many sons to glory. He joins in our suffering, his own suffering in the cross, destroying the enemy, defeating death. He is the perfect high priest, lifting us up on his shoulders, wearing us on his heart so that we can endure suffering and overcome temptation. So friends, if you are discouraged today, frustrated with your humanity, by the way, I'm only human, remember Jesus became human. He gets it. If you're discouraged today, suffering for righteousness, suffering for doing good, remember Jesus suffered Two, he gets it. If you're discouraged today, losing your battle with temptation, remember, he was tempted too. He gets it. Trust in the one 
who will bring many sons to glory. Trust in the Son of Man. Trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man. Oh, Lord, we place our trust in you. May we not put our trust in anything else. We know that you became one of us, that you identified yourself with us so that you could save us. We know that you suffered and died so that that we might not have to taste that sting of death. And all of that made you so much, so much better than the angels, so much better than anything that we would put our hope and our trust and our faith in. There is nothing that can free us from sin, from death. There is nothing that can remove our discouragement, our fear. There is nothing that can help us through temptation except for you. Oh, Lord, thank you for your deep, deep love for us, for making this wretch your treasure. In Jesus' name, amen. You please stand as we sing this closing song together.
friends, do we know this with all of our heart? That his wounds have paid my ransom. And that makes him so much better, not just than angels, but than anything this world has to offer. Let us continue to fix our eyes on Jesus. Go from this place and be encouraged. Be encouraged because Jesus took on flesh, became one of us, so that we might not taste the sting of death. God bless you, dear family. Those watching at home, we love you. We hope to see you sometime soon. Have a fun day. Be safe, y'all. We'll see you back next week.